high school. So that's where we focus our youth dollars. Um, and uh, we serve currently several hundred um, high school students that are in that category. So. Yeah, and I think you talked about, David, the, the reactive versus proactive youth dollars and even maybe even some of the adult ed now we're able to look at it more proactive ventures rather than reactive. Have you seen that? Well, I don't know that we've seen it as much as, as we would like, and Greg could, could comment on that uh, further. But I think that, uh, as we were discussing before the show, one of the, the, the things we have to do uh, as a Workforce Investment Board system is, is be, more, uh, be better communicators with the employers in our regions and really understand what their workforce development mm -hmm. needs are. Uh, I think we, we, this administration has, uh, through the Department of Workforce Development, has dedicated a, a, a substantive amount of resources to building the right infrastructure. Right. And we just need to take it to that next step where we're really going into the employers in the region, asking them what their needs are, and then working within our capabilities, but also, as Greg points out, the capabilities of our, our service partners in the region, and, and develop programs that help the employers. Because uh, workforce and economic development is only as good as the services you provide through it. And if you just stop and think about, uh, if, if you're not listening to your employers and, and their needs, um, you can't be sure that you're providing programs and services that fit uh, or that are serving an end need. And I think that's where this system under this administration has gone. It really has become one that says, we have to understand what we can best mm -hmm. deliver who needs it and how we're going to get it there as opposed to just pushing a lot of services out the door. Right. Yeah, and Dr. Exactly Del, right. yeah, and Dr. Del Santo, you kind of touched on this before, but we've seen this model where you have kind of economic development, uh, work, work one or workforce development, and university all sharing the same building. And I know that that's a passion of yours. Have you seen it some is. of those models that have worked like that? Oh, and they work beautifully, yeah, Phil. They do. The, having the opportunity, as David said, to engage employers and try to ascertain what their needs are, but also inform them about how learning happens mm -hmm. and how training is best conducted right. is a really wonderful outcome for both the employer as well as for the institution of higher learning as well. To bring workforce mm -hmm. in and have workforce as one of the the, the legs of the three-legged stool is an incredibly important mm -hmm. proposition. And, and you, you uh, touched on this when you visited our last board meeting here, and I think it's really worthwhile to mention on the other, the GED Plus. Yes. Maybe give us an overview of that. I think that's a wonderful program. Yeah, thank you for asking mm -hmm. about that, Phil. It's really one of our, our stars at the Department of Workforce Development. When, uh, when Governor signed legislation last April trans transitioning the uh, oversight for mm -hmm. adult education from the Department of Education to the Department of Workforce wow. Development, that was a great move because adult education and helping those folks who have dropped out of high school and don't have a GED to take that next step in life is a workforce issue. We have more than 500,000 wow. members of Indiana's workforce that don't have a GED mm -hmm. or a high school diploma. But let's help them get that credential. But in addition to having that academic credential, which addresses basic skills, let's help them to get an occupational certification as well. And that's where the plus comes in to the GED Plus program. Mm -hmm. We're asking all of our regions, Greg and David, to examine a list of 15 occupational certifications that we've identified at the state level, determine which of those are the best fit for the region in, around South Bend, and figure out which ones ought to be companioned with that GED. Examples would be commercial truck driver's licenses, mm -hmm a CNC operator, computerized right. numerical control, mm -hmm. a clinical nurse aide certification, a CompTIA IT certification, so that while the adult learner is getting that GED or getting their high school diploma, they can either simultaneously or sequentially earn an occupational certification free of cost to them. And it's a great program, one yeah. we've just started, but one I think is going to be the future of adult education. And will this region be one of the rollouts on that? Are we going to? Absolutely, right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is truly a partnership of adult education, workforce development, the community colleges, mm -hmm. the nonprofit literacy organizations and businesses, wow. all coming together, 
all sharing their load in moving this program forward. Yeah. And Region 2, the, mm -hmm. the workforce region around South Bend and Elkhart, has done a great job of moving that program forward. That's great. I, yeah, I heard a speech from somebody named Dr. Carol D'Amico, somebody like that, I don't know. It sounded, <laughs> sounded like she knew what she was talking about, but did talk about yes. those middle skill jobs. Yes. You know, 75% of all workers coming up here in the next two to three years are going to need some form of a certification or a two-year degree or something like that to go along with it. Sure. One of the issues, Greg, that along, we're talking about programs, but one of the issues that seems to be more prevalent today is veterans. Right. We see a lot of veterans coming home we do. Um, looking for opportunities in their communities. It's, a, it's, it's exciting, yet a huge challenge because these veterans sure. have been treated fairly well as it relates to pay and those kind of things, right. being in the military. What have you seen along those lines? Um, that is that is a little bit of a challenge. Um, we definitely want to get those vets and we want to get them reemployed. Um, they're coming back with a lot of skills, leadership no skills, yeah. technical skills, mechanical skills. There's a lot of mechanics, uh, logistics people, um, and we want to get them reengaged. Um, part of the challenge is we have to know that they're there right. and who is available to for you know for us to help. And uh, I would encourage any any vets um, that are looking for help to come to the work one to talk to us and identify themselves as veterans because they have benefits that are available to them. We certainly can help um, get them placed into into mm -hmm. positions that are um, suitable for them and get them reengaged. One of the challenges that we are seeing and it's um, I think an effect of the recessionary period that we were in that David mentioned earlier is a lot of the vets went for their tour of duty and they were at one income level and they come yeah. back and wages have fallen right. in many areas and so getting them re-engaged and understanding that the wage level may be at a lower level and helping them adjust to that has been a little bit of a challenge for us but that's we have our case workers um, and our counselors working with them on that and, um, and I know all of us share great admiration for the work they've done overseas oh, and absolutely. fighting for our country. Uh, another one real quick is, is prisoner reentry. Seemed a lot of discussion on that as well. Sure. Uh, this is a, a new program um, that uh, the state of Indiana is looking at and we're going to help pilot in this region. Um, I believe the numbers are 20,000 um, ex-offenders annually um, come out of prison right. in the state of Indiana. And that does not include local, um, you know. Oh yeah. Or yeah. right, or uh, federal prisons. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's 20,000 people there, and uh, getting them engaged and employed is a key element of preventing recidivism. You know, if they have a job, the likelihood of them going back, right. you know, is greatly reduced. So we want to get them engaged, and uh, so we're working with the Department of Corrections, mm -hmm. and they are identifying good candidates. Um, screening them uh, prior to their exit, uh, letting us engage uh, at work one with those individuals, and then work with employers to get those people placed into positions. Uh, we can help employers, we can bond those individuals with the employers. Um, we're actually finding that um, they make very good employees. They're very motivated and want work. Right, so. absolutely. Uh, David, we got about three minutes left. I want to get one comment from each of you, but I want to start with you. A lot of programs already going on, some, some great things happening in Work One. Where do you see things going in the future? Where would you see some of the future opportunities for our region's Work One? Well, I'm going to go back to my uh, last comment, and that's that I, I think the, the opportunity within the region to, to touch the employers and identify the specific skills and the specific needs of them as employers in our region mm -hmm. is going to be key to us taking this to the next level. Uh, uh, the workforce investment system uh, has to give something to everyone that walks in the door. And we can't be everything to everybody, mm -hmm. but we have to be able to uh, help the employers, the employed, the unemployed that are looking for the next job or the, a new job or looking for new employees. And, and so it puts the work one system in a, in a tough place because we really do have to provide something to everyone. Sure. Yeah, and I've, we got two minutes left. I want to get your thoughts, uh, Dr. Del Santo, on is there a perception that typically we are only looking to hire those who are currently employed? Um, is, there, is there a stigma behind those that are unemployed? Do, are we past that or where are we at on that? Well, I think we're not past that, okay. Bill, unfortunately. I think employers understand that in tighter times, they need to be more productive, use mm -hmm. their resources as, as optimally as possible. 
And so they are reluctant to take unseasoned workers. Sure. But that's why on-the-job training is a great opportunity for employers. And that's why doing things with students, whether they're adult mm. students or traditional students, to get them into the workplace, gain some work experience is a very, very important thing. Yeah, and we've got about a minute left, Greg. One of the things that we're going to start doing on our shows in the very near future here is offering an HR tip of the week. Um, I figured it's a great opportunity to have you provide this week's <laughs> HR tip of the week, but what do you do if you find yourself currently unemployed? Why are people hesitant to go based on some of the great discussion we've had today? Sure. I, I, I think the first thing I would tell somebody is don't panic. Right. Okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Uh, there's somebody here that wants to help. We have a lot of people that are, are very interested in helping. Um, I think people are a little bit hesitant to come into the work one because A, they have viewed it as the unemployment insurance office right. only. Uh, they don't realize what training benefits are available there. Um, maybe they feel they don't need the help. Mm -hmm. Typically, we see people after they've been out right. for a while. Yeah. Um, they think, uh, you know, that they can do it themselves. There's no reason to do that, okay? Um, if, if you find yourself in that situation, call Work One. Okay. Come in and see us. We want to sit down, we want to work with you, and we want to get you reengaged. That's a great tip. The only other tip I have is we're going to post all of your cell phone numbers if anybody's looking Wonderful. for a job. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, great discussion. Dr. Okay. Del Santo, thank you for being in our thank community you, and the great work you're doing downstate. Greg, keep up the great work here. I'm sure you'll take credit for it anyway. Sure, thank uh, you, Bill. <laughs> David, thanks for your, your involvement in the community, both from Ivy Tech and Work One, and making a difference in uh, rehabbing our district and our region. So thank you. Great. That's it for this edition of Economic Outlook, the show that puts focus on key business, education, and community elements that drive our regional economy. I'm Phil D'Amico. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Economic Outlook. A portion of Economic Outlook is underwritten by Northern Indiana Workforce Board and Partners for Workforce Solutions and by the Progress Club offering women of all ages an opportunity to develop lifelong friendships, challenge the mind, and work for the welfare of children and families. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.